the show. Let's bring this gentleman on right now, Xander, if we would, uh, the host of the NFL Matchup Show and uh, the senior uh, ESPN correspondent and the best ESPN correspondent, Sal Palantonio. Sal, how you doing? Oh, Pat, you mentioned it. I can't believe we are going into December football. It's a five-game uh, sprint to the finish right. yep. in the 2023 season, and every every down, every every quarter counts now. If you're yep. if you're if you're a playoff contending football team, Sal, I said in the open that this gauntlet that you and I have been talking about for Philadelphia uh, finally seemed to catch up to them. San Francisco came in last week off ten days rest in a home game. Laffer against Seattle, Philadelphia off of seven days and a five period overtime win against Buffalo. Did the Eagles just at least temporarily run out of gas last week? I do believe rest was a problem. I do believe the fact that the Eagles were on the field in the rain against Buffalo for 92 snaps on defense, that was an issue. No Zach Cunningham at linebacker, that was a major issue. There's no question about it. That's why you go out and you get a Shaq Leonard. Uh, just kind of shore up the linebacking spot. Pat, the 49ers had 148 yards after contact since week one. That's the most the Eagles have given up since week one of last year. That's the most the Eagles have given up, 148 yards of offense after first contact. You know what that says, Pat? That says that the tackling just was not there on defense. Right. So that's the number one problem. The number two problem was rest. The number three problem is they don't have a good third down defense right now. Yeah. And if you listen to Nick Sirianni in his press conferences this week, you listen to Sean Desai, they clearly know they have to change things. They clearly have said they're going to try different things. We're not allowed to see that part of the practice. None of the beat writers are. Uh, so you can't report on it, and players and coaches are not going to talk about exactly what they plan to do. Here's what I think they're going to do. I think you're going to see them blitz more on third down, take more chances, because right now blitzing four puts so much pressure, physical pressure, on your down linemen to get to the quarterback and so much pressure on your secondary to hold up in coverage for too long, and it's a major problem. And I think they will take some chances uh, in this football game against Dak Prescott. Problem is, Dak has been one of the best quarterbacks against the Blitz in the NFL over the last three years. So they, But they have no choice. Right. They're on the road against Dallas. They can't play a bend-no-break defense against Dallas in Dallas. They must take chances defensively. All right. Now, they just finished playing a game. And as you said, and I'll use your term because I think it's very descriptive. They got boat raced last week against San Francisco. But if you if you line them up, Sal, you got Christian McCaffrey, Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, uh, George Kittle. Now you go, you're playing Dallas. To me, it's not as formidable. You're talking about C.D. Lamb, who's very good. But there's a big drop to me in uh, the rest of the Dallas receiving core and the tight end position and the running back position versus what the Eagles just faced. If, if the Eagles could shore up their tackling, don't you th – I think they'd be in a, they're going to be in a much – they're facing a deep – an offense that I think they can compete much more favorably against. Well, all you have to do is look at what Seattle did against Dallas. Seattle put in a big scare against Dallas, against right. that Dallas defense. They sure did. Uh, they, they sure and, did. And, and how did they do it? They got the ball out of the quarterback's hands very quickly. Did. They they had uh, an offensive game plan in the passing game that allowed Geno Smith to get the ball out of his hands quickly. Now, on average, snap to release against San Francisco, Jalen Hurts was 3.92 seconds. 3.92 seconds is a virtual eternity when you're playing a turkey bowl game sure. with your brothers and cousins in the NFL. It is literally a galaxy of time. Right. It's ridiculous. Right. So, and if you go on various film study websites, as I do, and I study some film, and I obviously study the Eagles game, I'm here at NFL Films right now and getting ready for the show for tomorrow morning's taping. And you look at it, especially in the first quarter, in the first drive, they had some great play action fakes dialed up where they had receivers and tight ends behind the secondary and Jalen hurts for whatever reason 
did not pull the trigger, did right. not throw the football. Right. So, so that has to happen in this game. It To me, it's up to the quarterback. Right. I don't think it's the offensive game plan. I don't think it's the schematics. I will say this, Pat, people say, well, they're running. They're not running the ball. They're running the ball. They're not running effectively. It's not a question of running it effectively. It's a question of volume. No matter what you do, stick with the run game. I sent you those quotes right. earlier in the day from yesterday. Right. Offensive coordinator Brian Johnson said what? He said, it doesn't matter whether we're running well or not. we got to stick with it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, I lit a candle at St. John's Church for him to say just exactly that. And that's what we'll see. We'll see. But I think they have a good, uh, you know, funny. We talk about a 10 to 2 team having a puncher's chance. I think the Eagles. If, oh, if, I do. I think they're going to beat Dallas. Yeah. I, like I, them again. I think they got a good chance here. So that. two changes have to happen blitz effectively on third down. I'm using that word effectively for a reason. Blitz effectively on third down because Dak's good against the blitz. And two, stay with the run game. Why? It'll at least bleed clock so you're not putting your defense on the field. Your defense is gassed. They played a tough Niners team. They were on the field for 92 snaps against Buffalo. Take time off the clock. All right. When we get back here in this week in pro football, we are going to uh, talk with Sal about the schedules of the the, uh, four uh, teams vying for that number one seat in the NFC. And we'll also get to hear from Sal on his six teams that have separated themselves in the NFL. That and a ton more on this week in pro football presented by Kennedy Ford. Hi, right, welcome back to this week in pro football. Pat Callahan here from Great South Palantonio from ESPN and the host of the Matchup Show. All right, Sal, before I bring up that screenshot, let me let me follow up with you on what you were just talking about with the run game. All right. Uh, and the question is this: can DeAndre Swift do it? And as a corollary to that, Leonard Fournette is sitting doing nothing on the Buffalo Bills practice squad. Why wouldn't he, did the Eagles, are, do they think, are they thinking about, go sign him off that practice squad, get him in there. And he, a guy like him, a Jay Ajayi type to eat up that clock. Your thoughts on that? Well, Pat, I have been on your show all year long and I have been advocating one more running back. I said that in September, they are one running back away. Now I think it might be a little too late to bring a running back on. I'm not in the mind or in the office of Howie Roseman, but, you know, Howie looks at everything. That's the brilliance of Howie Roseman. His phone never stops. Pat, they only had 18 rushing attempts against San Francisco. Right. Uh, 48 pass attempts. And, you know, they didn't run the ball early. They didn't run it late. They didn't run it enough. They have one of the best run game coordinators in the NFL and Jeff Stoutland. They have the best offensive line in the National Football League the most athletic center in the NFL, a guy going to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Right. They are fully capable of running the ball on anybody. Last year, can I remind you, basically the same defense except for Javon Hargrave, the Eagles ran the ball down the Niners' throats yeah. in the NFC Championship game, yeah. four rushing touchdowns. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not the coach of the team. I don't pretend to have all the answers. But this seems like a pretty simple solution to me. And I don't think, Sal, that the Dallas front four is is, except, is very big. I think it is that front four that can be run against. I think you just run uh, right at Micah Parsons and uh, and eliminate his biggest assets. The Eagles are averaging 4.1. They're, they're eighth in the league in rushing yardage, 4.1 yards, versus last year they finished with 4.6. Uh, so, I mean, it's not like they've abandoned it. No, the problem is not personnel. It's desire. Right. Yeah. And they ran at Parsons. They ran it right at Parsons when that Dallas came in here. Pars- you go back and look at the stat sheet of that game when the Eagles beat Dallas in Philly. You won't find Micah Parsons on the stat sheet. Yeah. yeah. All right, Sal, again, uh, let's talk about that Eagle defense there just again for a minute. Now they're facing a team I said earlier in the show, scored 40 points, uh, over 40 points in four straight games. Uh, the Eagles defensively, Sal, uh, 
uh, as you pointed out to me earlier in the week, and I saw this from Elliot Shore Parks, uh, they're 24th in points allowed, 29th in points allowed per drive, 29th in red zone defense, uh, and they've given up their 27 pa- touchdown passes allowed, which is 31st in the NFL in front of only Washington. So, I mean, these stats are piling one on top of another. Uh, but is this something that can be materially fixed in time for Sunday night? Blitz. That's the answer. They don't have a tremendous amount of speed in their secondary. They have savviness. They have experience. They have toughness. They have smarts. Blankenship, super tough guy. Slay knows what he's doing. Bradbury knows what he's doing. Byard certainly does. You watch them on tape. They're close to the top in the league in defensive pass interference, the defensive holding in the secondary. Right. Because guys are getting by them. Right. And the reason why is because – the pass rush is not getting there. If the pass rush gets there, the secondary will look good. All right. Right. All right, Xander, why don't you bring this up, Sal, if we could uh, for a second just take a look at the schedules of what I consider to be obviously the four contenders for the number one seed in the NFC. Uh, I think the Eagles, you and I, you mentioned it, and I, I, I gave you the credit for it earlier in the show. The Seahawks, this is a seven-game gauntlet the Eagles have faced here, not six. They still got to go to Seattle, uh, which is going to be a tough out, flying back from Dallas to Philly, then all the way out to Seattle for what is now a Monday nighter. But then a pretty vanilla finish for Philadelphia. Uh, what do you think of that? The, the Dallas schedule looks a little more daunting, yes? It certainly is. Um, I like the Eagles' chances on Sunday, bounce back game. Uh, uh, they haven't beaten Dallas in Dallas since 2017. Right. They are due. Jalen Hurts is due to have a better game. Dallas Goddard will be back at tight end. I think their passing game will be better and more productive. I think the things that they're going to try will be effective against Dallas. I think they'll have real problems at Seattle because Seattle's going to lose this week to San Francisco. Right. And Seattle's Waterloo will be Monday night football against the Eagles right. uh, in week 50. That, that right. will be a very, very difficult game for the Eagles, I think. And yeah. then, uh, you know, it's Giants, Cardinals, Giants, and, uh, you know, the Mummers Parade. And that's about it. <laughs> the, the, I, I mentioned earlier, Sal, the 49ers schedule it does not look very tough. Seahawks, Cardinals, oh. then they they do host the Ravens at the Commanders home against the Rams. I think Seattle's going at worst, Sal, four and one. So Seattle's going to win 13. I mean, San Francisco is. And the Eagles have to uh, hold serve there and if they want to keep that number one seed because they lost to San Francisco. All right, Xander, thank you very much uh, for that. All right, Sal, you had mentioned, uh, looking around the league here, that you've seen you see six teams that have really separated themselves going into the last five weeks. Right? Yeah, you got five games left, so let's handicap this. It's a five-game sprint to the finish. You just put up the NFC. I have – really only three teams that I see in the NFC that are fully capable of making, you know, an unadulterated Super Bowl run. And I think it's Philly, Dallas, and San Francisco. I I think Detroit, um, you know, it could act as a spoiler. I think Detroit's going to have a really hard time against Chicago. It's never easy to win in Chicago in December. And the Green Bay Packers could be a little bit of a spoiler for somebody. Uh, Seattle, You know, Seattle's next two games will decide the fate, I believe, of that organization in many ways. The quarterback, maybe the coach. I agree, yeah. Uh, So Seattle, the next two games, could make a lot of noise. There'll be a problem, but they're not going to the Super Bowl. And in the AFC, it's Baltimore, Miami, and Kansas City. Uh, You know, Buffalo could be a spoiler. Denver blew their chance by – Russell Wilson's three interceptions against Houston last week. They had a chance to win that game in the fourth quarter. If they had won that game, it would be a different story. Denver would be making a run, but that's over. And Trevor Lawrence is hurt, or Jacksonville would be a serious problem for just about everybody. Um, The one thing with Baltimore is Lamar Jackson was sick at practice again today. Yeah. uh, And missed a little portion of practice as an illness. He's always. Sick in the month of December, it seems. Yeah, it's true, Sal. It is um, true. I, I just always am concerned when I, you know, they they had 14 wins four years ago and lost to Tennessee at home. Right. Uh, it's, you know, 
in the right. opening their opening round of the playoffs. I think it was a divisional round. Right. And then Tennessee lost to Kansas City, and Kansas City won the Super Bowl that year. But right. I mean, Pat, you know, Lamar is like Dak to me. You got to prove it to me in the big moments. And Sal, and staying in the same conference for just a minute, Sunday, Buffalo travels to Kansas City. This is it for Buffalo. Uh, they're sitting there, the 10th uh, seed now in the uh, AFC at 6-6. Six and six. Uh, But do they have a chance here? Because their offense is much more high octane right now than Kansas City's, which is really hard to believe. It is. Um, if you're just looking at matchups, personnel, and scheme, Buffalo should win the game. But it's really hard to win in Kansas City. Right. It's really tough to do. Yeah. So I don't know if they're going to be able to pull it off. Right. You know, they had a hard enough time uh, winning in Philadelphia uh, when the Eagles are giving up so many more yards than Kansas City's defense. I think it's going to be a tough game for them. Their their major game, their standoff game, line in the sand game, if you will, will be when Dallas comes in there okay. uh, the following week. Right comes into Buffalo. Right, right. All right, Sal Pal, I got a few minutes left with you, and I'm going to do this. I, I mentioned at the start of the show about officiating again and how, again, it's the official root canal of the National Football League. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to provide you three ideas that I think the NFL could do, and I want you to just comment on each one, okay? All right, you got it, Pat. Here we go. All right, because I think that the, the, the solution to bad officiating is less officiating. So first off, Sal, eliminate. Pat, whoa, whoa, Pat, you can stop right there. Right. You, I agree with you 2,000%. The right. solution is not more penalties and right. more officials. Right. It's less officials right. and less penalties. Fair enough. Because okay. when you look at the games and you look at them closely, and everybody who's watching this program at home is a football fan and watches the games closely, you right. could literally call three or four penalties on every right. single play. Right, right. You're right. So my first one, eliminate the illegal contact rule, that five-yard rule. Now, I'm not saying that the defender had, had, could drape himself over you like, uh, uh, like they used to do back in the day, but that it's not automatically a penalty after five yards. I, I, everybody's just sick to death of a third and 17, and one of those incidental contacts happens, it's an automatic. Contact. I don't agree with that. I think the biggest thing has to be um, pass interference. They have to find a way where you call pass interference and it's not a 50 yard penalty right. uh, that if, it, if it's over a certain number of yards, then you only get 25 or you only get 15 All out right. of it. All and right. there has to be degrees of pass interference too. Okay. How about if you, just if you tackle a guy, then it's right. It's a spot foul. Right. If you get entangled with a guy, yeah. then it's 15 yards. Okay. There has to be differences. And here's the real problem for the NFL. And I agree with you, Pat. Roger Goodell said in, in five or 10 years, I forget that number he put on it, the NFL will be an international game. Right. Pat, if you have this level of officiating problem yeah. and this, and, and this yeah. high number of penalties, you're not going to get the international audience to love the game the way we do because yeah. we've loved it our whole lives. That's fair. That's entirely correct. Now, let me just try these two of them and see. All right, I'm over one with you now. Let me try this one. And it seems minor, but I don't I don't think so, obviously. I'm promulgating it. And that is, go back to the old offside rule. I'm sick and tired of this. A guy flinches on the defensive side and, and comes into the neutral zone, but the ball's not snapped yet. All five offensive linemen get up like they've been hit with an electric prod and you get a, a neutral zone infraction. You don't need that. Let him get back. If he gets back, the play continues. All right, Pat, I'll give you. I'll give you that one. All right, appreciate it. My last one, Sal, is <laughs> they've got to stop with these completed pass rules. I'll give you an example. The game, Jacksonville uh, – no, it wasn't uh, – yeah, it was. It was uh, – I think it was Jacksonville uh, where a pass is completed in the end zone and the defender clearly has trapped the ball. He's clearly trapped the ball, but instead what we get is – Oh, no, his hand was underneath it. He had control. No, no, no. The ball is half on the ground. I think the league needs to go back to that's an incomplete pass, and that's the end of it. Your thoughts on that? Well, I have to look at it really much more closely. I think the bottom line is you're right. There needs to be fewer penalties and fewer officials. 
now that you have a, a major part of the operation gambling, a right. uh, major source of money you and major right. scrutiny, this is a big issue. Yep. And if you want to grow the game internationally, this is a big issue. You're and right. if they don't look at it, they're making a mistake. And I, and I know you're going to have Eric Allen on very shortly. Right. Uh, I want everybody who's listening to get on social media and promote Eric Allen getting from the current semifinalist of 25 down to 15. The voting is happening right now. The voting ends next week. I'm one of the 46 selectors that vote. Paul Domowich, everybody knows him, used to be at the Philly Daily News, is a lead presenter. I'm helping Paul. I think the number one thing to remember, if you go on my Instagram site, Sal Pal ESPN, I have this very critical stat that separates all the other numbers you'll hear about Eric Allen. And you think to yourself, why in the world is Eric Allen, the original shutdown corner, not right. in Canton, Ohio? Eric Allen has more interceptions, Pat, and more return touchdowns than 41 of the 45 Hall of Fame defensive backs and more than 21 of the 23 Hall of Fame corners, right. Pat. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, it's an inalienable stat, Sal. It, 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 it closes the door on that debate. It really does, in my opinion. He should be in the Hall, given that. Uh, and I'm going to talk to him about it, Sal, but I, I, I just think uh, – and it's great what you're doing. It's great what Paul's doing. Uh, we need to – because this guy's been too anonymous in his career. He was just, he was just a really, really, really excellent player – but uh, he was no Lester Hayes. He wasn't Mike Haynes. He wasn't flamboyant. He just did his job, and he was a quiet leader in that locker room. And uh, But I think oh, yeah. he's got a really good shot this year. Oh, I hope so, Pat. You know, and I would implore everybody, listen, enthusiastically tell your friends and your family, get on social media, and the more public knowledge there is, that will put pressure on the voters to pay attention. Uh, you know, we, we've done our part. Uh, certainly this is, we're getting close now where, you know, he's going to go into the senior pool and then it's going to take forever for him to get in. So right. we got to, we got to act now. This is it. All right. Well, Sal Powell, it's great that you're doing that. And I know your voice carries a lot of weight in that room. It's so good for you. And thanks a lot for joining me. I'm the me. tip O'Neill of that room, Pat. <laughs> I got, the, I got the best sweater like you. I'm, I'm like the tip owner. Pat, Just where do you get that best sweater? Is a nice sweater. We've got uh, a Brooks Brothers sweater, yeah, Pat. What do you uh, got? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I swing by Ventresca's every now and then and just see what's Hey, up. Pat, I'm an extra large. I like that blue, <laughs> navy blue. Yeah. Tell Frankie Ventresca, Sal Pal, needs a sweater. I'll sweater. do it. I'll do it right away. Just remember, all football is local, right, Sal? Is that a famous saying, right? All right, South Palantonio, everybody check out the matchup show Saturday and Sunday. in South Palantonio, thank you very much. We'll talk to you next week after the Eagles and Cowboys. All right. politics is local. That's what Tip O'Neill said. <laughs> I know. <laughs> all right, and South Palantonio. Football Thanks. is global. You got it, Pat. I'll talk to you next week. All right. South Palantonio, as usual, an excellent segment. Thank you very much to Sal for joining me. All right, listen, we get back here. Sean Green is going to check in, and we're going to talk about some picks and some props, Eagles, Cowboys, and a couple other big games this week. It's This Week in Pro Football, presented by Kennedy Ford.